Hi, this is Theory Station. I'm John Duggan. The program we're in is Rational Choice Modeling. The series is called the Basic Formal Theory Toolkit, and this is installment 17 in the series. Um, so here I'm just going to continue talking about the one-dimensional policy choice model with voter uncertainty, and I'm going to um, try to just skip the writing and paste from last time. Uh, so this is the model that we were talking about. And um, we talked about, um, you know, so here we have this, this noise term here that's a random variable. So we talked about what that means, what a continuous random variable is, how you can represent that with a density function. Um, so now I want to get back to the decision problem facing the politician. And um, let me put some structure on the problem. So we're going to assume that oh, here's our policy space. Uh, it goes from minus 1 to 1. So I like to put in 0 there, although I don't really need that for now. In fact, let's get rid of 0. So um, let's assume that uh, the politician is here on the you know, toward the left, the policy space. This underlying ideal point, let's say, is here to the right somewhere. And looks like I forgot to put in the status quo, so let's add that now. That's a pretty important one. So the status quo policy is going to be in this policy space somewhere. Let's assume that it's over here so that we have this ordering of the politician to the left of this uh, structural ideal point to the left of the status quo. Um, so now um, suppose, let's think about the probabilities um, that the politician would assign to different proposals passing. Uh, suppose that the um, politician proposes, let's say, this x here. Okay. Um, so will the voter approve or reject that proposal? Well, it depends on where the voter's ideal point ends up being located. Now, we're assuming that the voter has Euclidean preferences here, so that means that they'll approve this proposal if it's closer to their ideal point than the status quo is. And we've talked about this sort of thing before. Uh, if I put in the midpoint between the proposal and the status quo, so that's, that's just the average, x plus q over 2, um, then as long as v is to the left of that midpoint, that means they're going to be closer to x than they are to q. So, um, so for those realizations, the voter will accept the proposal. And um, for realizations above that midpoint, the voter is going to be closer to the status quo and so the voter will reject the proposal. So, um, so what's the probability that this proposal of policy X is accepted by the voter? Well, it's the probability the voter is to the left of that midpoint. So it's the probability that, um, that V satisfies this inequality. Okay. Um, of course, we know V is uh, V is V naught plus epsilon. And so um, if we just subtract this V naught from both sides, The probability that the voter accepts is just the probability that um, 
the epsilon is less than, oh, I forgot to, minus by naught, okay. So the probability that the voter accepts is just the probability that epsilon, this noise term, is less than the midpoint minus the structural ideal point, okay? And um, remember how a distribution function works. If you, um, if you plug something into it, then it gives you the probability that the random variable is less than or equal to that, right? So the probability that epsilon is less than or equal to this level, we can write in terms of the distribution function, just like so. So that is the probability that um, the voter accepts. Okay, so um, if, if x were actually um, over here to the right of the status quo, then we would have to rework this expression. But the politician's never going to propose anything over there. I'm just not going to worry about those proposals. Um, okay, so I, I want to keep um, this expression in mind. That's an important one. All right, so that's that's for any relevant policy proposal X. Um, so how are we going to use this? We're assuming the politician has quadratic utility. Um, so obviously, if they could, they would just choose their ideal point. What they have to do, though, is propose some policy that will, you know, be approved with some probability and rejected with the remainder, the remaining probability, and they have to somehow do that optimally. But what does it, what is, what does optimality mean in this setting? So that leads us to a new idea, which is expected utility. Okay, now I'm skipping all the foundations of this. There's um, some beautiful theory behind expected utility, and it forms kind of the, the backbone of an area called decision theory. And it's, it's very um, well-developed. And here I'm just gonna skip all that stuff. And, um, and I'm just gonna talk about how it applies to the particular model that we are looking at. Okay, so um, so let me just define the expected utility from the proposal of X. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to um, I'm going to look at the the politician's utility from X. Um, and of course, you know, if X does not, if, if X is rejected, they get, um, they get the status quo. So I'm also going to think about that. I've got the utility from X, I have the utility from the status quo. But since X is approved only with some probability between zero and one, I'm going to put that, I'm going to basically weight the uh, utility of X by the probability that X is accepted. And I'm going to weight the utility of the status quo by the probability that X is rejected. Okay, I'm just going to add those up. So, um, right, so there's two outcomes. X can be accepted, in which case that's the policy that the politician obtains. Otherwise, it's rejected. The politician gets the status quo. So how do we evaluate uh, the success of that? Um, or how, how do we evaluate the, um, 
effectiveness of that proposal, we're going to use this expected utility idea. Okay, so um, you know, if X is a fantastic policy for the politician, that doesn't really matter if the probability it's accepted is very low. Okay, the politician has to factor in both things. Um, so we've already um, uh, we've already figured out what the the form of that probability is, right? So um, the probability x is accepted is just f. It's just this, right? The probability that x is rejected is just the remaining probability, which is 1 minus that. Okay, and um, that's the expected utility. Okay, now um, what we would then do is we would uh, impose the optimality principle. Uh, so the politician is going to choose the x that is the most effective, that is, that gives the highest expected utility. So the politician's problem is this okay um, I'm only going to consider proposals that are um, uh, on the left hand side that is on the politician side of the status quo and um, and we can also rule out the politician proposing anything on the other side of their ideal point so basically we'll think about policy proposals between the ideal point and the status quo and um, and then the politician will maximize this expression. Okay, so um, so before I get into that, let me add something to the model. Um, it, it's a parameter that um, allows us to capture something that's not in the current model. So in the current model, the politician does want their policy proposal to get passed, um, but uh, you know that's only so they can get their their policy through. Maybe there's actually uh, some benefits to having your proposal pass, um, even if the policy isn't so great. So it could be just that you look good to your constituents, um, or you know. Well, this is a bit outside the model, but you know, maybe you just want to go home and have dinner. Uh, let's add a term to this model, and um, so we'll call it uh, beta. Let's assume it's non-negative, and this is the benefit of um, having your proposal succeed. Okay, um, and that's going to be just measured in units of utility. So how would that affect the politician's problem? Well, what it does is um, it changes the utility when the proposal is accepted because now you don't only get the, the utility from your proposed policy, but you, you would get this beta, okay? So, um, and that's also true here. Um, you know, it's a it's a minor addition to the model, but you know, it is another parameter that gives us some flexibility, and um, you know, it's something that we can we can play around with when we're analyzing the model. So, um, all right. With that said. Let's um, let's think about solving this problem. All right. So um, for now, let's just think about um, what, what do optimal policies look like, um, and let's assume let's just talk about optimal policies strictly between P and Q. Okay. So. Um, 
well, in that case, you know, we have some objective function that we're maximizing, and we know that at a maximizer of that objective function, um, that optimal policy proposal will have to satisfy the necessary first order condition. So um, that's a bit messy to write out, but um, let's do it and then we can um, move on. All right, so we have to differentiate the objective function here and um, with respect to x. And we can see that x enters in in these places here. OK, uh, the trickiest thing is that this distribution function is multiplying the utility from the status uh, from the policy. Um, and so we're going to have to use uh, the product rule. Um, so let's first let's first um, take the derivative through the policy utility. So the, the first this probability then, I'm just going to write that out, that's multiplying. I'm going to take the derivative of the policy utility plus the beta, and that's just going to be the derivative of the utility. Okay. Um, now, now we're going to fix the policy utility plus the beta, and we're going to take the derivative of this distribution function. Well, that is just um, the density, okay, and that's, um, that comes from the relationship that I wrote down before, that the distribution function is just the integral of the density, and we're basically applying the fundamental theorem of calculus here. Again, there's some math behind that, but you can take my word. But notice actually that um, inside this density function, uh, we have, uh, it's actually x over two. So um, we're gonna have to use the chain rule, um, right? And then multiply that by the derivative of x over two, which is just one half, okay? So, um, so finally, we've taken care of, of the derivative of these terms. Um, now on this side here, it's a little bit simpler um, because the status quo doesn't depend on x. So that's just a constant. We're going to take the derivative though of the probability of rejection and that's going to be, um, well there's going to be a minus, sorry. Now, again, I'm using this fundamental theorem of calculus. So it's going to be negative 1 times the density evaluated at x plus q over 2 minus v naught. Um, and then we need to use the chain rule again. And then that whole thing equals 0. OK, so that's a messy expression. Um, now. If we had functional forms, actually we do have quadratic utility. Um, I haven't said what the, the density of the uh, this shock epsilon is, but if we had functional forms, we could solve this equation and then that would tell us, the solutions of that would tell us all possible optimal policies strictly between P and Q. Um, but the point of formal analysis is not always just to calculate things. Um, we like to get, as well, we like to get intuition or insight from our models. And um, in this case, well, we can do some manipulating of this. Um, I see we're running late. I'm gonna just come back to this in the next installment uh, just to keep this at a reasonable time. And um, so, We'll keep on talking about this model. Um, it's, yeah, it's an interesting model. We'll see that there's a lot we can do with it.
Um, so that's coming up. I'll see you in the next one.